once again, thank you for attending the very first Wheelhouse Talk of the 2012-2013 series. To get us started, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Bill Holsinger Robinson, who lives out the very concept of blue sky, wide open thinking, and blue ocean innovative strategy. Bill is known for his work with TEDx Grand Rapids, Seed Collective, 5x5, Five Five, and as the founding executive director of Art Prize. Bill works hard to make exciting things happen that have a positive impact on our community. Even after speaking with him for only a few minutes, Bill's creativity and optimism are contagious. If I had to describe Bill in my own words, I'd say he's like the Chuck Norris of all things cool and creative. <laughs> he gets things done. Currently serving as the Frederick Meyer Endowed Honors Chair in Entrepreneurship and Innovation at GVSU, Bill is a professor and mentor for students with the next big idea. Please join me in welcoming our first wheelhouse speaker, Bill Holsinger Robinson. Okay, uh, that was a crazy kind of great uh, introduction, actually. Seriously, Chuck Norris? <laughs> wow, I will be giving a roundhouse kick of entrepreneurship and innovation here today. Though. So. Uh, thanks. Uh, actually, that introduction makes me sound much more impressive than I, uh, than I think I am, uh, really. Uh, you know, I walked around uh, before this semester got started with a business executive from Grand Rapids. I uh, walked around the, the Grand Valley campus, and he made, he made comments about uh, somebody, uh, another leader within the community that had this kind of aw shucks uh, persona saying that there had to be so much more below the surface of this person for them to be such a great leader and move so fluidly throughout the community and throughout their career. Uh, and I just want to say, uh, trust me when I say that there's nothing below the surface here. Uh, what you see is completely what you get. Um, when Brian Flanagan asked me to, uh, to give this talk today, you know, I, I do what I typically do in situations like this, uh, Art Prize included, uh, and I said, sure, thinking how hard can this be? Um, and when I started to dig below the surface, I realized that uh, the task at hand, uh, kind of what the task at hand was going to be all about, um, this has been really difficult. Um, you know, uh, thinking about and reflecting on, you know, what I see as the challenges of leadership and kind of what the, what the very nature of leadership has been a really tough thing to think about the last, the last couple of months. Uh, so much so, in fact, I mean, I've been working on this presentation up until, up until this morning, which I'll, I'll get to in a sec, too. Um, uh, but what you're going to find out from me in this talk is that nothing that I do uh, is set in stone, and everything is kind of a constant work in progress. Um, so consider, you know, something to be true today is that you'll find no hard and fast rules about anything that I, that I say. Uh, I hope that everything is open for... Um, Arguments in conversation and interpretation, and please disagree with anything and everything that I have to say. And I'm specifically talking about uh, all the people with the reserved seats, uh, which is which is great. Um, uh, you know, consider this a framework for leadership, or per perhaps even uh, a series of design principles more than anything else. Um, you know, again, it's a work in progress, and I'm really uh, kind of excited to, to share this with everybody and to to gain uh, everybody's feedback. Um, you know, it, it, this all kind of reminds me too of last week. Um, uh, there was an event at um, sponsored by Kendall College of Art and Design, along with Art Prize and uh, Design West Michigan. Uh, there was a, a panel called "The Difference Between Art and Design," um, and I found it really curious. Uh, Joseph Rosa, who's the director of University of Michigan's uh, Museum of Art, made a really interesting observation. Um, and to paraphrase it, he was speaking so fast, I tried to jot it down. But to paraphrase, uh, he said, art critics get too wrapped up in the technique of the expression than the achievement of the expression. Um, that is, they, they get too wrapped up in the, the brush strokes instead of what those brush strokes are, are attempting to communicate. Um, and I think there's an interesting parallel in the conversation and dialogue um, about leadership and management. Um, uh, because, um, um, you know, there's a there's a sense in which there's a sense in which so much uh, attention is paid to the technique 
of leadership than the expression of, of that thing that's trying to be communicated through leadership, through that, through that vision. Uh, you know, I have general angst uh, in speaking about leadership in general, just because I am certainly no technician, although I try to fill my head with, uh, with the latest thinking um, uh, about leadership and management, and mostly just to be a part of kind of the broader conversation, um, as well as to understand kind of the, the evolving vernacular. Um, shared nomenclature around this topic is very, is very, very critical. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to lead groups of people who have had both successes and failures, uh, ultimately all successful in one sort of expression or another. Uh, and I gotta say this at the outset too, um, I am not a good public speaker, uh, and that's basically my shorthand way to try to ask for forgiveness right now so that you're prepared for this and that you're a friendly audience to me. Thank you. Seriously, mean that. <laughs> uh, so, so, what do I think about leadership? Um, to me, it can be all kind of uh, summed up in a simple phrase: tag. You're it. Um, remember the game who played tag when they were growing up? Yeah, shake it. Come on. Show of hands. Okay. Okay. Everybody knows tag. Um, so, I was brainstorming with a cohort what a playful theme might be for uh, for today, and we came up with this idea. Um, and I'm really starting to like it kind of more and more in general because uh, it's, a really great, it's a really great metaphor for leadership in all sorts of actions. It's both simple and at the same time I think can be sophisticated. Um, and in fact, I think I'm gonna be using it as a theme for another uh, whole series of other uh, projects that I'm associated with this year. Um, and as a side note, I really kind of like the theme too uh, because I saw the theme used in an episode of Mad Men uh, I've recently become turned on to the show. Are there Mad Men fan fans out there? A small handful of them, okay. Um, I'm actually completely hooked right now uh, through the wonders of Apple TV and a subscription to Netflix. I've watched uh, three seasons of Mad Men in an embarrassingly short period of time. Uh, embarrassingly short period of time. And, and you know, the, the interesting thing is, uh, you know, for the fans out there, I'm not hooked on it because uh, Don Draper is so charming, and, and Joan is so enticing, and Betty so neurotic, uh, but because I think the exploration of the human condition that they portray is actually really, really uh, engaging. Uh, anyway, in this episode that I was watching, um, Don assen uh, assigned Sal, one of the people that works for him, uh, his first commercial directing assignment, and in that action he says, tag, you're it. Um, and in that moment, you can feel both the weight and elation of being a leader in this project. Um, you know, the opportunity to direct possibilities uh, and a clear directive to take action. You know, this fundamentally is leadership. Um, in a ritualistic sense, that is, you know, a moment when simple, utter words change reality. They, they change the ontology of how we think about things. You're a leader. Um, you know, when you're tagged, it's not even just that formal uh, uh, action that takes place. Uh, you know, when you're tagged, you can decide whether you want to play the game or not. You know, how many of you have been in situations on the playground, remember back, somebody tags somebody and they're like, no, I'm not gonna play, <laughs> right? But everybody else that you've gotten to, to, uh, uh, to sign up, right? They all have energy and kind of the community kind of forces you to play tag and whether you, reluctantly or not, you get involved. There's, there's action that's inherent in all of this stuff. Um, so you're still expected to do something. Uh, you know, what I think is interesting though too is that you can be tagged with all sorts of things. So it's not just that formal, you are now a leader, you, you manage people, you're running a project, you're running an event, you're doing things for business. Um, but you can also be tagged with information. Right? You read an article and you feel like you're moved or because you have this information, you have to act on it in some way. Um, you can be tagged, um, uh, with a challenge or responsibility, uh, but ultimately you are responsible to take an action. Uh, leadership in and of itself is, is, a, is an active task. Um, and that's what I think is really great about thinking about this metaphor too, is that as in tag, you need to continue to pass along leadership. Um, great leaders get other people involved in the game that they play. They recruit people to play. How often has tag been started by one person wanting to play and they simply say, tag your it, right? Now you have two people, they've gotta find somebody else. Uh, you can have no tag backs, 
right? Um, but you have to get other people involved in the act. It's a social experience, and it's not just about the person who's it, but it's about the game, it's about the venture, and it's about the vision itself that really drives everything. Um, that's where the whole analogy and the metaphor just completely falls apart, though, right after that, so I'm not gonna take this that much further. Uh, I'm not saying that there's like a freeze tag of leadership, um, or that to be uh, uh, untagged and unfreezed that you're gonna have to crawl under somebody's legs, because in most instances that is completely inappropriate. You need to know that, right? <laughs> Um, but I think that's I think it's I think it's really interesting like that. Um, you know, personally, I have never uh, I'd like to say that I've never sought out leadership positions. Uh, someone, or most usually, uh, some idea has been the thing that's ultimately tapped me and essentially said, "You're it." So, all of that said, uh, what do I think about leadership? What are my lessons? Um, this is all as I said it before. I'm going to reiterate it over and over again. This is all clearly a work in progress. Um, but, I, but I have five kind of quick lessons that, I, that I'd like to share. Um, but first, uh, so all of the leadership fellows in the room, can you guys like raise your hand? Right, right. So I sent out a reading list, uh, actually reading watching list. Uh, so for those of you who are not this group, uh, there was basically a, a, a list of uh, uh, inspired materials that um, help to influence how I think about leadership. Now, have, did you guys like read articles on this stuff or read any of the videos that I sent? Yes? No? Yeah. All right. Um, so so uh, I actually thought long and hard about the, the, the list that I would compile together and decided that I wouldn't have this like really heady list that I put together, but just the one that kind of came to me. So that list includes, and I'll be kind of referencing some of these things throughout the rest of the talk, that includes George Nelson's uh, how to See, uh, A Guide to Reading uh, Our Man-Made Environment. It's Simon Sinek's uh, TEDx Puget Sound video on how great leaders inspire action. It includes a new documentary that came out last year about Ray and Charles Eames called The Architect and the Painter. Um, it includes a classic book on leadership, Leadership is an Art by Max Dupree. Uh, and it also includes uh, a really great little book uh, by Gordon McKenzie, who was the uh, creative director at Hallmark Cards called Orbiting the Giant Hairball. So, all of that stuff said, uh, five, five really kind of quick lessons uh, um, from things that I've experienced. So, so the first one, and, and this is all for you guys uh, specifically, the first one is a really simple one. Uh, it's know yourself. And specifically, know yourself deep, deeply. Uh, know yourself, yucky flaws and all. Um, who in this group has taken a personality test before, one of those strengths tests before, like in the whole group, right? Which, which ones did you take? Did you take a Colby? Show of hands? A few people. Myers-Briggs? Wow, a lot of people. Uh, now Discover Your Strengths? A uh, smaller handful of people. Art Prize people up there have taken that before. Thank you. <laughs> um, which is great. Um, I've taken my own fair share of these things, and I actually find them to be immensely useful. Um, uh, I have taken, uh, for those of you, just, just so I can share all of this stuff, uh, for Myers-Briggs, I'm an ENTP, for those of you tracking this stuff, that's the visionary. I didn't, I didn't label this stuff. Uh, I'm a 3386 with a Colby test, meaning that I'm an innovator, and with the Discover Your Strengths, my top five strengths are ideator, strategist, communicator, uh, input and activation. Um, these are all basically parts and pieces of a framework that I use to understand myself and how I interact with the rest of the world. It's in a sense a, a, a 360 view of who I am so that I can both portray uh, uh, you know, actions and communications to other people in the most appropriate, most effective ways. But it also helps me to understand exactly where my strengths lie. It helps me to understand the types of things that I should not be doing at all. Like if you want me to follow the same process over and over again, uh, you will end up with that process being reinvented over and over again, <laughs> just so that I don't have to check things off the list. Other people are really fantastic at, uh, with stuff like that. You know, um, I know that I am a procrastinator. I'm a really awful procrastinator, um, which I learned uh, you know, over the years means that I have to work uh, on creating very, very aggressive goals for myself. 
Um, and that's everything from, uh, I've bike raced for years and I have to set up really aggressive goals with that. Uh, the first art prize, uh, the really aggressive goal with that is that we announced it to the public in April and then six months later launched it to the public uh, in, a, in a big way in September, which will be four years uh, now for the event coming uh, next week already. My gosh, it's coming really fast. Uh, but really, really aggressive goals which means that I don't have to overthink things. I know this about myself. These are things that you need to know about yourself. And you know, beyond being, um, you know, the, I, I, guess a, I guess the thing is how I know this is that I've been very experimental with myself and my own reactions uh, to the world for a number of years now. I've been very introspective about that, about that whole thing. Um, because my career goal uh, for me has been really about creating a more complete person. Uh, uh, I've, been, I've been joking with some folk that you know, some people are really lucky that they have this straight path career goal. I wanna be an accountant, uh, and then I wanna be a senior accountant, and I wanna be a CFO, right? and I like, work through this process. And the reality is, is that most people's careers go this kind of jiggy-jaggy line thing, right? Um, where you kind of go back and forth on, on, on what you're interested in and what you're not interested in. Mike keeps going round in circles. Uh, I keep finding myself like coming back to the same basic uh, human questions, the human conflict uh, condition questions about what does it mean to be a human being. Uh, and I keep, seem to be keep uh, uh, asking those questions in a different context, whether that's working for a, a corporate entity or working for a startup or working for an arts organization or starting a brand new venture, I, I seem to find like I'm testing myself in these different places. And I think that's something important that all really great leaders do, is that they test themselves constantly. You know, because beyond the uh, inherent benefits of, of knowing yourself, you know, the real value here is that, and, and all, uh, it's, it's interesting, you know, I read an article the other day talking about uh, um, venture capitalists. And venture capitalists, there's, there's, there's one main Thing that they look for in companies that they're going to invest in, right? And maybe something that surprises you. So how many of you would say like business model is the first thing? You guys already know the answer, don't you? <laughs> uh, you know, it's not business model, it's not, it's not market, um, it's not necessarily, you know, already have existing profits. It's all about the team. It's all about the team of people that are put together on that initiative is the main thing that they're investing in, particularly with young companies. Uh, they look for people who have capacity, but they also look for people who are coachable. That's a word that's used over and over again. How well are you able to gain perspective uh, from your mentors, from other members in the community, from your own team, right? This is what makes really capable teams. And as being a member of the team, clearly and articulately understanding where your strengths lie is critical to the success of the team and critical for you playing the exact right role within that team. Um, you know, so the real lesson here is to surround yourself uh, with friends and cohorts who uh, will tell you the truth about you, right? Um, uh, and you work to leverage your strengths, you know, uh, not correct your weaknesses, but to be acutely aware of these things. That doesn't mean that you don't challenge yourself, but you use that knowledge of yourself as a template uh, um, to go about it most effectively. Um, so two, that was one, so two. Uh, have a vision. Um, have a vision that's tight and constrained and speak with passion about the things that you're interested in, that you're working on. Um, this is your why, right? This is your purpose, uh, um, your meaning. You know, you really need to figure out ways to connect with people and customize that story or vision in ways to speak specifically to that audience. Um, how many of you watched the Simon Sinek video? A good, a good handful of you. For those of you who haven't, um, uh, we'll put up a link someplace, but you've got to watch this video. He says some very, very simple things um, that are really important about how great leaders inspire action. Um, you know, mostly the, the, the talk is around driving towards this, this view and asking the question, what's going to get you out of bed in the morning and why should anybody care, right? Great leaders inspire basic action around that. Um, a couple of quotes from that video that I, that I particularly like is, people don't want to buy what you do, they want to buy how you do it. Or what I think of in another way of saying it is that they buy into a vision of the world that you see and the possibilities that it creates. 
So regardless of the size of the project or the business or the event that you're working on, learn how to articulate that thing. What's gonna speak the most to people, right? Um, what's going to get them up out of the morning and what's going to get them to, to care about anything that you're doing, regardless of the, regardless of the size, and communicate it in their terms. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a funny video, another TED video, I'm kind of hooked on TED videos. Uh, there's a funny TED video um, uh, called How to Start a Movement. Um, it's put up there by uh, Derek Sybers, who is the, uh, was the founder of CD Baby. It's like a $100 million company that I think Amazon picked up a couple of years ago. Um, and it, essentially the video is, is uh, him, he, he, had taken, he had taken a short video of a park and some music being played. And this one lone nut uh, dancing wildly to this music. He was all by himself, right? Um, and what his, what his point is, you see in this video that finally somebody joins him and they start to dance kind of in this uncontrollable, I am not going to demonstrate this. Uh, but they dance uncontrollably and before you know it, somebody else joins and somebody else joins. And three minutes into this video, the whole crowd goes rushing over and they do this uncontrollable dance to presumably music. The interesting thing is, is that, is that um, you know, in thinking about thinking about leadership, we always think that we have to be the first, the first person out there with this vision, and that's not necessarily the case. One of the things that Derek says is that, is that the first follower is actually an underestimated form of leadership in and of itself. Um, the first follower is what transforms that 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 uh, that lone nut into a leader. Right? It's that first person who stepped forward to say, yes, I agree with this thing. Let's create a team around all of this. You know, for you entrepreneurs in the audience, uh, that first follower is sometimes your first customer. Right? It's the first one who sees value in what you're trying to do and understands, understands that story. Uh, considering that our prize is coming soon, I mean, that was, that was one of the challenges that we had with our prize was telling this vision, right? So you gotta trust us. We're gonna throw this event where Hundreds of venues are just going to sign up because they want to participate in this thing, and we're going to get thousands of artists to put their stuff all over the place. And that's going to be spoken word and performance and visual and sculpture and social experiment and everything else, and it's going to be great. And we think something like 40 to 50,000 people, once we're successful, are going to show up in this thing, right? And it's going to be fantastic, right? We had to tell this story and this vision over and over again. We had to talk about the engagements of the arts and what, how it was important. We had to talk about this future state that didn't exist and get people to understand how important it was and get them to be excited about it. Now, obviously, with that particular example, um, uh, you know, it was it was very successful. We had 200,000 people. Is that still the right number? 200,000 people showed up the first year. Uh, because they, they, they started to embody this vision. They started to believe in this potential future, and amazing things happened as a result of, of all of that. Um, so much of leadership is getting people to believe your reality in the context of their reasons, right? Um, you need to tell them the story over and over and over again. The third lesson um, is trust good people. Um, you know, build strong, strong relationships with people. Um, you know, there's a there's a uh, there's an old there's an old uh, phrase in business: uh, hire slow, fire fast. You know, there's something to be said about about building relationships with friends and other other coworkers uh, that way as well. Which means pay an awful lot of attention to the people that you're bringing onto your team. Uh, whether that's a team for a venture or even the team that's your group of friends, right? To have the wherewithal to build strong relationships with, with people, uh, to understand where their strengths lie, and then get them to run as quickly as possible to accomplish the task at hand. Um, how many of you have read uh, or, or know of this book by um, uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin uh, called Team of Rivals? Does this sound? Oh, good, there's a good handful of people out there. So, so this, is a, this is a book that's about the Lincoln's presidency, and there are probably some historians in the audience here. Uh, uh, so I'm gonna paraphrase from the, from the entire book. It was a drum roll, it's, it's my five minutes. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase from it, some historian, historian can stand up later on and correct me about all this, but it's essentially about Lincoln's presidency and how 
um, he, he, he won, uh, it was a surprise, actually. He wasn't the most talented, wasn't the most uh, uh, technical, wasn't the most experienced person, yet, yet he won the presidency. And particularly where, uh, where the United States was at that time in history, it was in a moment of crisis. And so what did he do? He, he took all of those rivals uh, who were uh, looking to be the president of the United States themselves and brought them all onto his cabinet. So these are people that, that presumably had some very, very different views than he had. And he pulled a team together and created a very, very obviously successful presidency around all this. But the, you know, the lesson is, is that driving, um, uh, driving uh, to a spot where you have as few blind spots as possible, where you've opened yourself up to so much perspective that you're bringing in really good, strong people and you're trusting that they can do what they do, um, is, a, is a critical factor, letting go, telling that vision over and over again and trusting that people will step up to it. Um, um, I've had the good fortune of working with some really, really fantastic teams. Uh, I'll use the Art Prize team because they're in the audience. Some of them are right now. Um, I assembled a really fantastically strong group of individuals who I knew I could get out of their way to perform the task of launching the first Art Prize. Um, it was too big of an event for me to do by myself and probably too big of an event for all of them to do individually. But we pulled together, right? Everybody had a vision. Everybody knew the direction that they were heading. And, and we, we moved forward. Sometimes my vision uh, didn't work. And so we were able to use their individual points of leadership and their experiences to twist and tweak that event. I mean, I think the event that's starting next week is slightly different in really great ways um, than the event that we first launched, uh, which is all a part of that giving ownership of this, of this vision to a really strong team. Uh, number four, for those of you who are keeping track, uh, is, is more of the same, uh, which is about being open. Uh, so be open to change, be open to be wrong, uh, and be open to fail. Um, it's all about being open to other perspectives. Um, and in that openness, finding patterns of truth. Um, so one of, the, one of the books that I recommend that everybody reads is this, How to See, uh, by George Nelson. Uh, George Nelson, uh, um, famous designer, worked very, very closely with Herman Miller for, for, for a number of years. Um, he published this book in 1977. Um, uh, and, it's, and it's a book about how to how to recognize and evaluate the things that uh, surround us and how to decode their meaning uh, from visual information. Um, the pursuit of design uh, you know, is not about the th way things appear, uh, but rather about the way things have meaning. Um, these things add or detract from the human experience. You know, the book really is, is kind of timeless in an approach, and even though a lot of the photographs that you'll find um, are clearly artifacts of an earlier age, uh, it's actually fun looking through the book for that because you find like old rotary telephones and, and calculators that are as big as a desk, but like really, really intriguing designs. Um, uh, they're all, they all kind of clearly reflect important aspects of our humanity. And so the real, the real charge here in reading that book is to thrust yourself into new situations. Right, to travel, to learn a language, to learn a new skill that you, you know, is completely foreign to you. Um, because all of those things help you gain perspective, uh, which is the most important thing I think you can bring as a, as a leader is perspective. Um, when, I was, when I was in graduate school, uh, one of my professors said, I, I think one of the most important things that I've, uh, that, that's helped my career. Uh, and he said, he said three simple words, he said steal, Steal, steal. Um, and what he meant by that was, was pay attention to the inputs in your life because um, you're always going to find inspiration and, and points of innovation from other places. Uh, he had a whole technique around this. So this was, this was actually uh, in the days before the web, before the libraries were all online. Uh, and he said, once a month, because this is when this has happened, once a month, uh, go to the library find the journals of some topic that you're even just remotely interested in, flip through the journal, find an article that you're interested in, and photocopy it off. Uh, you can do that for three or four disciplines and you'll have your reading for the next, uh, uh, the next period of time. 
right? And you can do this on a monthly basis. And from that, you'll be able to find inspiration from the way people are thinking about the world in very, very different domains. And the whole challenge is, is to apply them to other situations, to look at the patterns. I mean, how many amazing innovations have come from that space? Whether it's, it's looking at nature and looking at, uh, I just heard of, uh, um, there's work being done uh, in the Midwest on an insect repellent based upon, uh, is it spider ven venom or some uh, enzyme that's used with spiders, right? People say, hey, spiders have been catching and basically providing natural insecticide for hundreds of thousands of years. Why don't we apply this in a different situation, right? It's applying these things. Um, I had done some work in graduate school where we basically took the work of Noam Chomsky and thinking about language and universal grammars the way people think universally, right, uh, about language and how language was formed, and we started to apply it to religious thought, um, and started to come up with notions of similarities as, a point, as opposed to points of differences, right? It was an innovation. That's actually a whole, as a side note, that's actually a whole discipline that started up over the course of the last 15 years, which is really, really cool. Um, and finally, uh, finally, number five, uh, strive for balance in everything that you do. Uh, famous psychologist Eric Erickson once said that the richest and fullest lives attempt to achieve an inner balance between three realms, work, love, and play. Uh, and let me repeat that. The richest and fullest lives attempt to achieve an inner balance between three realms, work, love, and play. Um, you know, one, of the, one of the things that I wanted everybody to watch was this documentary on Ray and Charles Eames. Um, I think Ray and Charles were such really great examples of this. Um, together, their work was completely focused, or everything that they did was completely focused on their work, uh, their love for one another, um, and this sense of playfulness in everything that they did. Um, you know, and for those of you who know any of the history of Ray and Charles Eames, uh, you'll certainly agree that their relationship was not perfect in any sense, but it was definitely always striving for this sense of wholeness. Um, ultimately, this striving for balance can be used as, a, as, as again, a, a source for strength and for perspective. So uh, what materials didn't I cover? Uh, the book Giant, uh, uh, Orbiting the Giant Hairball, really fantastic. Um, it was originally published in 96. Uh, I received the book in 2000 from a really great friend, and this book is kind of equal parts rumination on corporate culture, acts of leadership, and the biography of the author, Gordon McKenzie, who was a 30-year veteran of Hallmark Cards, as you see since passed away. Uh, he created a position for himself within that corporate structure uh, that he called the creative paradox. Um, essentially, he said, my job was to be loyally subversive. Um, I love this uh, book because I consider myself to be loyally subversive uh, in the community or anything that I do, basically bringing in new perspectives. And it's, it's, a, it's a great, really, really easy read. Uh, and there's a really great quote by Rumi, uh, the 13th century Persian poet in the front of this book, um, uh, a poem entitled, entitled Wean Yourself. Um, and the poem says, little by little wean yourself. This is the gist of what I have to say. You ask the embryo why he or she is cooped up in the dark with eyes closed. Listen to the answer. There is no other world. I only know what I've experienced. You must be hallucinating. Uh, drive yourself for these other experiences. Uh, and the other book that I, I don't think that I mentioned was Max Dupree's uh, Leadership as an Art. Uh, it's, a great, it's a great book for those of you who did not raise your hand. Uh, Max was one of the CEOs of, of Herman Miller, uh, founded a leadership center that is in Pasadena, California, doing some really great things. Uh, but I really love this quote about leadership from Max. Uh, leadership is an art, something to be learned over time, not simply by reading books. Leadership is more tribal than scientific more a weaving of relationships than an amassing of information, and in that sense, I don't know how to pin it down in every detail, and I most certainly don't either. So, all of that said, tag, you're it. Um, I was asked to present the challenge to this group, um, to everybody assembled here, and uh, have everybody gather together and take some time as you're leaving to start some dialogue around this, and so here's, here's my challenge to you. Um, how do we enable a less risk-averse culture in West Michigan as we work to build out our entrepreneurial community? Um, you know, uh, this is all about creating a, risk, uh, a culture of risk-taking, 
And it's all about creating these big, hairy, audacious goals for our community as well. So how do we do that? And with that, thank you. I think, it's, I think it's interesting. I mean, you're, you're, you're right. There's been a lot of conversation about failure. I mean, failure is failure, right? Um, and there should be emphasis put on the lessons learned with all of that. Um, I was in, uh, I've been in Silicon Valley um, a lot over the course of years and have heard this conversation over and over again um, as, as teams are being assembled for new, for new companies. Oh, did you, did you hear about Bob's last venture? It was a complete and utter failure. Uh, we need to bring him on the team because I've had a conversation with him and he's learned amazing things. Um, you know, there's some things that only can be learned at that level uh, that hits you viscerally, right? It hits you in the middle of your gut uh, and you'll never make those mistakes again. Um, which, is, which is a really great thing to talk about, you know, uh, taking your own challenges as, as leaders, uh, taking a step forward and prototyping, right? Do something, you know, have those experiences. There, there's nothing worse than trying to hire somebody who's a recent college graduate who has not uh, tried to apply themselves in, in any way with a new venture or a project or something like that, where they can say whether they were success or I tried this thing and I failed miserably at it, but let me tell you what I learned from this thing. Um, maybe we should create a, uh, a whole video series, uh, Failures of West Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> You laugh, but it'll get lots of views. It'll be awesome. Should I stand up? Um, you talked a little bit about um, how you're, you used your career goals as a way to create a more complete um, version of yourself. Can you expand on that a little bit? And for those of us who are starting out in our careers and, and trying to navigate uh, without a clear direction, can you just? Talk about your experience and how you've um, navigated your own career with that that understanding. Does that make sense? Yeah, <laughs> maybe. Because um, I'm not. I, I'm. It, this is all still a work in progress for me. Sure. Um, my career continues to unfold in interesting ways. Uh, starting a new business in town too. That um, um, I've I've decided. Actually, I, I think I decided early on that I was going to follow my gut even though my gut might not have a lot of experiences yet. That's why, that's why I have a degree in philosophy. I mean, seriously, <laughs> who in any right mind would like get a degree in philosophy? Uh, because all you can do with that is you become a chef and then apparently you become an entrepreneur and stuff. I don't know. Um, but I've just, um, I've always, I've always fo focused on my curiosity about, about things and have just kind of trusted that the world will fall into place. Because if I can get really passionate about something, um, I'll learn more about how to how to better enable and harness that energy um, into something of substance. And so I always have this inner dialogue that's going on in my head about the person that I want to be. Um, and I'm always you know, very ambitious about myself. I'm not really particularly ambitious externally, but I'm very ambitious uh, internally, very, very competitive internally. I mean, I think that's something that you just need to cultivate over a period of time. So I've had some students that have come up to me because uh, part of my job at GBSU is to connect students with the outside world, right? Get outside of the bubble of the university. And I've talked about kind of loosely about opportunities and then I have students show up at my office and they go, yeah, I'd love for you to hook me up with some stuff. It's like, great, what are you interested in? Uh, uh, I, I, mm, that's a good question. And so some of it is about, is about you know, like cultivating the sense of curiosity um, and then having, having some sense of trust with yourself, right? I mean, that's the first step in becoming a more complete person is trusting that intuition and trusting what your inner voice says. I think, I don't know. Uh, sometimes people tell you to let go of that last hole. <laughs> Uh, which is perfectly fine. Sometimes you need that uh, uh, kick out the door. Um, uh, I think I've started to get really good at, at feeling. Um, that's a, I, I, I have this weird history where I reinvent every seven years. Um, and I think, I think for me, it's, it's not that I couldn't do more in that thing or that there are other opportunities. I just get really bored with things. 
um, and realize that I want to blow whatever it is that I'm working on up. And, and I think the sense is, it's like, oh, this is successful. I want to blow it up. Mm, that's probably really, really bad. And so that's when I personally decide that it's time to move and start to satisfy some other kind of internal cravings that I have. Uh, that was actually one of the things I, I thought with ArtPrize I was going to have like a lot of opportunity to blow stuff up because who knew that it was going to be so successful at first. And actually our second year was really, really crazy hard because uh, it was successful. And I had a whole team of people who were really great at like creating new things and blowing stuff up. And so our, our task the second year was to say, well, what's the pattern of this event? And we created like this formal design brief out of it. And the challenge was, was to stick to the design brief, was to constrain ourselves more and more. Uh, uh, and I had, to, I, had to, I had to get out of that. <laughs> it's a really great team that's, that's there doing really great stuff now. Does, does that answer the question? Kind of, sort of? Yeah, and it, it's, it's hit or miss, too. You know, I, I, uh, I resigned from all of the stuff that I was doing last summer um, because it looked like the economy was popping up and a whole bunch of other things were really great. And then a month into it is when we had one of those really nasty uh, downtrends in the market. Uh, and I had those great entrepreneurial wake up in the moment of panic saying, what did I just do? Uh, moments, and now here I am talking to all of you people. This is great. <laughs>